Well, hi, I'm Ruth Duclo from CLIC. And our CLIC member libraries administer the CLIC digital collections using a shared OCLC content DM subscription. And thanks to Minitex, um, our records are in DPLA through the Minnesota Hub and also in Minnesota Reflections. So thank you, Minitex. Well, I'm here to introduce Kevin Taggart, who is a native Texan, and he's currently working as a library services consultant at OCLC. Uh, before joining OCLC, Kevin worked for several library services startups for Houghton Mifflin Harcourt and for Microsoft. He was also at IBM for 18 years, where he served as a client liaison for Fortune Global 100 companies. Um, he taught at the University of Texas at Austin, the Université Paul Verlery en France, um, and at Middlebury College. And he owns a he holds a BA from Trinity University and an MA from the University of Texas at Austin. Now also, he, I did say he's Texan, so he sent me a Texas brag in an email. So since I'm Minnesota nice, I'm going to read it for you. <laughs> um, Kevin's passion is studying the Cold War period in American history with an emphasis on the presidency of John F. Kennedy and recently, Kevin had items from his personal collection of JFK memorabilia accepted into the permanent collection at the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas. So, yeah, kudos. <laughs> yeah, let me give you Kevin Tagger. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the kind introduction, Ruth, and thank you, Minitex, for all of the work that you do. And Valerie, that was a beautiful, beautiful speech this morning. Thank you very much. Also, DPLA, thank you for the work you do, and thank you for all of the work that your organizations do to connect people with their history. Also, that was a pretty, that was a pretty Texas braggy introduction. And I showed that to my cousin who's in, who lives in St. Cloud, and she goes, that's very Texan. So, which I guess means something up here that, yeah, that's, just, that's very Texan. So, OCLC, see if I can do this right, is a global cooperative, if you don't know who we are, uh, with 18,000 members in 121 countries. So there's a lot of members. Uh, we provide service and conduct research to help libraries, uh, archives, museums, and other cultural heritage institutions meet their missions. Today I'm gonna to talk about three different initiatives that we're working on. Uh, open access, community engagement management software, and IIIF, and John mentioned IIIF earlier. Uh, let me talk a little bit before uh, I get into these initiatives about this. This is a photo from 1931 that I found in one of our member institutions' digital repositories. Um, it's uh, the Alaska State Library. I was really lucky to find this photo because I, I look at archives all day long. I'm really lucky. I get to spend lots of times in archives and in digital repositories. So a lot of times, what do I do? You Google your last name, or you, you Google, I'm so sorry. You search for your last name, um, and sometimes you get lucky. This time I happened to get lucky and I found something really cool. So this is a photo that was taken, as I said, in 1931 in Alaska. Uh, and this group of youngsters was filming a movie called Eskimo. Uh, in Inuit. The entire movie was filmed in Inuit. That's pretty amazing in 1931. Okay, that's a great fact in and of itself, but what, what's meaningful to me and why I bring this up is because when I was looking for my last name in uh, one of our union catalogs, up popped this photo. And the red-headed guy on the top right-hand corner, that's my grandfather. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's my granddad. So, I'd never, we'd never seen this photo. My granddad left South Dakota in uh, 1927. Uh, he's a fifth generation South Dakotan um, and went to school out east. Uh, and he unfortunately graduated from law school in 1929. Not the best year. So what happened was he just kind of disappeared. And we don't know what happened to him until 1933 when he married my grandmother. So this fills in a huge hole in my family history. So having what, what I want to get at is that feeling of connection 
that we all provide our patrons is what we're all here for. And some of the work that OCLC is doing behind the scenes is really helping further that cause and helping people connect with their history. So I visit a lot of cultural heritage institutions, about eight to 10 a month. Oh, by the way, this is how I know my granddad, okay? So being able to see him young at the age that my son is now, my son is 23, my granddad is 23, it kind of changes things a little bit. Yeah, it changes the way that I see him and the ways that I see myself and the way that I see my son. So, I just, and I love that photo. He apparently, he would hand these out uh, when he was running for judge. And on the back, there's some really funny things too. His qualifications are, are quite 1960s, they're cute. Anyway, this, this connection and being able to, to make this connection and see things differently is really powerful. And that's something that y'all do every day. You help people connect. Oops, I need to go back one. So because I visit lots of cultural institutions, I, I have to learn about them quickly. And actually, I find that mission statements are really, really helpful. Have you all on, been on mission statement committees to put those together? Yes. It is painful. I've been on them myself. But they really, really, really work. They mean something as guiding principles. Um, and we should continue to look to them. So what I did in getting ready for my talk today was I took uh, the mission statements from 10 Minitex participating organizations and OCLC and the DPLA. And because I'm a visual person, um, I put them into a word cloud. Thank God for these word clouds. So you could, I eliminated any words that were like, if there was only one occurrence of it, I got rid of it. But this is what pops out from our shared mission. Um, access, connecting people, giving them access, and helping them discover their history. And the other words that pop there are community, and um, enrichment. So these are, these are your mission statements. This is our shared mission. So some of the work that OCLC is doing hopefully will help further that mission so that you can allow your patrons to connect with their history like I did earlier. Minnesota popped up. Oops, back to granddad. So because I talk to, to libraries and museums and archives all over the country, I hear about the struggles that we have that prevent us from allowing our patrons to connect with their history and have that, have that feeling that I had earlier about my granddad. So I listen to folks, and in my brain, because there's a large GFK component in my head, um, I, I just decided to call this all of this set of challenges the, the digital frontier. So. Um, how, what is preventing us as cultural heritage institutions from meeting our mission of connecting our communities with their history? I'm sure you all can think of five or six. It's what we have to deal with every day. Uh, how do you make content more available? How do you engage your community? How do you know what your community needs? Uh, how do you advance digital access? How do you let people see these, these items that you have in your collections? How do you manage the collections? How do you know what's coming next? Does that all sound familiar? Yeah, so that's what I call the digital frontier. Uh, and John made a, uh, a JFK reference earlier in his speech, which I, made me giggle. That was awesome. He said the torch has been passed. And I went, yes, OK. I knew that one. So let's talk about uh, open content. Uh, open content is a big topic right now, and I'm sure you've talked about it around your, I've talked, it around, I've, I've talked about it around my dinner table, which my family's not very happy about. But um, libraries, I'll just use the term libraries, are expected now by researchers, by patrons, by funders even, um, and especially by um, end users uh, to provide open content. But that's really a wild, wild west world, isn't it? Open content. And some of the, uh, the challenges to open content revolve around just what the definition of open content is. So I decided to look it up. I'll read it to you. It's uh, long. Uh, open educational resources are teaching and learning materials that are freely available online for everyone to use, which is a fantastic idea, whether you're an instructor, student, or self-learner. Some examples include full courses, course modules, syllabi, lectures, homework assignments, quizzes, labs, Classroom activities, pedagogical materials, games, take a breath, simulations, and many more resources contained in digital media collections from around the world. Well, that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of standards to have to keep up. So what is OCLC doing in that area? 
Uh, we're doing a lot. We're working with governing bodies, publishers, content providers like you, aggregators and libraries, um, to enhance the visibility and accessibility of open content. So what are some of the challenges around, or, or to use my term, the digital frontier around open content? I'm sure you all can think of some. For instance, is the content gonna be there? Is it trustable? Um, who's put it up? Who's writing the standards that identify open content? And um, who's gonna correct it if it's wrong? Because really, if, if, if the goal of open content is to give access to information to folks who may not be uh, usually served, but can you always trust it? So those are some of the big questions that I've run into that I call the digital frontier. And really, what, the big question around open content is how do you fund it? How do you create it? How do you govern it? And how do you sustain it? So why is that important? Because open content gives access to, as I mentioned, populations that might be underserved. It lets people use primary source sets from their communities, which is just absolutely beautiful work. Um, and it saves money, which all we all want to do. So what, uh, what's OCLC doing, Kevin? Well, we've decided to make open content an integral part of our strategy. Uh, we have a meeting um, of our global council, and uh, they decided to, that open content was one of our primary objectives. So we, we're starting the conversation with people who are making that content. And I think that's one of the most important things is to just keep talking about it. You can't always come up with solutions, but um, as we heard in earlier, uh, earlier discussions, keeping the conversation going is key work. And that's what y'all are doing all the time. So what are we doing? We're, let's see if I got some bullets here. We're making more of it available. And we're putting that content into our catalogs. Because if you don't, if you don't put it, your, if you don't clean it up and put it in your own content, content in your own catalogs, um, then that's just a lot of words. And we're supporting industry initiatives around open content. And we're partnering with folks like you. So it's really about your input um, at the cooperative. So uh, one of the ways that we're increasing open content is again partnering with all of these folks to make it available, which I think is really exciting. So it should be, it should be a community effort. So we're partnering with these publishers and aggregators and OA directories. And in the last five years, what we've been doing is looking at uh, peer-reviewed articles and looking at standards around those. And we'll be adding open content uh, from institutional repositories and archives into our catalog. Also, OCLC Research, the folks up in Dublin who are thinking all these um, awesome, great thoughts and working with y'all have teamed with different organizations and uh, made suggestions on how to change Mark uh, 21 records. And the thing is, they're doing that all based on feedback from you. Uh, yes, they're up in Dublin. Um, I'm down in Austin. But they're up in Dublin thinking about these things, but they can only do it based on feedback that y'all give them. And because we're partnering with institutions, it's really a community effort. That's something that I want y'all to understand. I hear over and over again at OCLC about partnerships with different institutions. Uh, and that's really what it's about. Without, without that, there's not much else. So now let's move on to um, challenges managing collections. And when I say collections here, I'm specifically referring to libraries. Um, we probably have some public libraries in the room, but the paradigm is changing. Currently, collection management systems, your ILSs, are built around work, workflows. How do you get an item from one area to another? They're not built around the, the people that we want to serve. So we've started changing the conversation around the way systems are managed. Um, because there's the problem of the disappearing patron. If, if one is spending all of one's time doing processes, it doesn't leave much time for the patron. So by looking at the way, by changing the paradigm, hopefully we're gonna make the patron, put the patron back in her place. So what are some of the challenges that, that OCLC's looked at and we've heard about? Um, libraries have told us, we have too many tools. We have too many systems. We have a system that does this. We have a marketing system that does this. We have another system that does this. And we spend all our time managing our systems, but we can't get any information that's relevant out of it. So based on uh, feedback from libraries, OCLC is developing patron-focused management. 
and it's built around the patron. It's built around marketing and analytics, and what it does, I'm not here to sell this product, I just want to tell you about the, the, the cool thing, which is it lets you basically, instead of focusing on the bibliographic record when you're managing your library, you're focusing on the patron, which is a complete shift, and I think it's a shift that's needed. We have uh, this platform is called WISE, and it's basically designed around people. It's not designed around the, the, the record or the item or the, the bibliographic information. It's designed around users and driven by data. So you've got all of this data about your patrons, and you're able to make decisions about how to market to them. You're able to send out stra uh, strategized marketing materials. Uh, it does things that many different systems do all put together. And it's called WISE, and it's a platform. And we have four libraries who are currently participating. And the cool thing about this, um, yes, this is a great product. I'm not really here to talk about the products. So what I think is interesting about this is, A, we're putting the patron back uh, in the right place. We're giving power to the patron, which is a phrase that I like. But we're also working with these four libraries to create this, this, this software. And it's a synergy that I've not seen at OCLC before. I saw it at IBM, and I saw it at Microsoft, where you had uh, you had lots of input and you made really quick decisions. So I'm excited to see that OCLC is doing that uh, around um, the patron. And again, why is this important? How does this help? How, does, how do community engagement systems like this help support your mission of connecting people? Well, again, it's about access. It's about changing the way you think about your daily work. And I, there's that phrase again, it's about the power to the patron. And again, it's community focused and it's based on feedback that we're getting from member institutions in real time, which to me is really exciting. Digital repositories. We probably all are familiar with those. So I spend a lot of my time working with digital repositories and I hear feedback, lots of it. And what's the digital frontier for, for digital repositories? Well. Accessibility is one of the big ones. And our mission statement was to connect people and let them access their history. Well, uh, people are having a difficult time now. Things are difficult to find uh, and difficult to manipulate. And there are disparate systems, disparate viewers that might not work on some of the, the, some of the new technology. And there's just so much out there. I know that in um, the digital repository system that OCLC has, we have 62 million digital items. We added six million just last year. That's a lot of stuff. How do you help your patrons get through all of that? How do you allow your patrons to, for instance, find a photo of their grandfather like I did so easily? Well, it's not, it's not quite that easy as we all know. Access is still difficult. So what is OCLC doing around that? Because basically our patrons have kind of gotten used to the Google experience, haven't they? Earlier I said I just Googled my grandfather and up came the photo. Um, but the, the way that patrons are looking at digital repositories is also changing. They expect lots of different things. They expect new tools. So OCLC is thinking about what's next. And we, John earlier mentioned the, uh, the International Image Interoperability Framework. God, I don't have to say that every time I talk about this. Or IIIF. Have you all heard about IIIF? I mean, other than from Sean's speech earlier? A little bit? Okay. It's basically a set, it's a, it's a framework, um, and it's community driven, and it just allows uh, for plug and play software. And we've made it um, integral to, to our digital repository software. I'm really excited about this. I think this is really, really breakthrough because of the different abilities that it gives folks. Again, community-based and focused. It's a, it's a group of these institutions making these decisions. And I think that is key. Well, Chelsea is a founding member of the AAAF initiative, and we're helping to uh, think about the ways that digital collections are going to be used. So back to this plug and play software. Um, AAAF is basically a set of APIs, and I've struggled with what an uh, API, I don't know. Um, I've struggled with what that is, and I just like to use the plug and play uh, analogy. So if your software uh, works with IIIF, you can easily, I say easily, we all know what easily means in software land, um, plug and play these different viewers into your digital repository. And that's huge for smaller institutions, or huge for people who don't have a lot of coding staff. 
So being able to make this kind of open source cool software, I'll show you some examples in a minute, available to smaller cultural heritage, heritage institutions, to me is, is game changing. This is gonna change the way that patrons interact with items. Mirror Door is a viewer that we've included and um, let's see, Mirror, Mirror, Cantaloupe is one we're thinking about. So let's look at, so what is this? This is a view uh, from the Harry Ransom Center. Since I'm a Texan, I'm gonna stick with Texan institutions because I know them best. They're down in Austin. This is a map from their digital repository and that's the same map. I pulled both of these maps into one browser instance and I'm looking at them at the same time. And you can tell that I was, you're able to, your patrons are able to manipulate that image in many different ways. You can see at the top there, um, they can uh, do contrast um, and flip views and change the colors. And why, that's important for several reasons. Scholars have said, hey, there's a lot of stuff up on the web, but we wanna be able to work, work with it together. How do you do that? Um, how do you work with repositories that have been broken apart? Uh, due to uh, unfortunate colonial practices, a lot of, in, a lot of collections are all over the world and, dis, and, and just separated. How do you let patrons put those back together digitally? AAAF lets you do that. Another thing that AAAF lets you do that I'm excited about is we don't know what these tools, what kind of access that's gonna give folks. Um, by switching this color, for instance, someone at the HRC was able to figure out what the wood plate that was used to make one of these maps looked like. So they're having their students recreate that plate simply based on being able to flip colors. So changes in access like this, uh, we don't know what this brings, but we're happy to bring these tools uh, to cultural heritage organizations. Okay, I could go on about IIIF for a long time. Let me show you another view. This is a book view of a Gabriel Garcia Marquez uh, manuscript. Imagine, one. how would you have done that before? How would, you would have to have maybe three different browser views. It would have been really difficult. Now people are just able to, patrons are able to access this information and work with it in really different ways, which to me is astonishing. Probably one of the coolest uses for this is, I mentioned earlier that repositories are really siloed. Um, there are things everywhere. Um, how do you put those together? Well, AAAF lets, lets patrons take items from repositories running AAAF, regardless of, of the systems they're running. It could be Fedora, it could be uh, Digital Com, it could be anything that runs AAAF. I don't think Digital Commons does. But, because really patrons don't really care what system you're using. They just want access to the information. Um, this is, on the, on the left you've got a Blake a plate from the Harry Ransom Center, and on the right you have a plate from the Yale Center for British Arts. And what I did was, I was on the Ransom Center site, and I was able to just quickly pull in that other print and look at them together. I, they're not running, these, these are two different systems, but AAAF doesn't really care, like our patrons don't either. So to me that, that opens up a whole lot of cool possibilities for patrons. We're proud to be a part of the community effort that's driving AAAF. And how to, coming back to the mission of, of connecting folks with their history, obviously these all kind of start to look the same. Access, it's lower cost, and opens your content up for comparison with lots of other institutions. And again, most important thing, we're doing it as a community based on feedback from y'all. Three ways that uh, OCLC is helping, hope I touched on all of those. So what I invite you to do is take a look at what OCLC is doing. Uh, I think that the, the changes that we're making in uh, technology are really exciting. I think our focus has shifted a little bit. And uh, I'm excited about the fact that we've made a commitment to the community and made a commitment to actually keeping these discussions going. And I think that's what you expect from your cooperative. And I'm happy to see that, happy to say that it's, it's working and it's happening, but it kind of takes you all to do it too. But back to this, I wanted to say a little bit more about this picture, um, about finding my granddad. So when I was preparing for this uh, presentation, I looked at the record on the Alaska State Library and I noticed that uh, the young woman in the front was named Mabel Taggart. Uh, that's not my grandmother's name. Yeah, we do, I, I'm like, I looked at this Sunday and I said to my family, who's Mabel Taggart? 
So uh, that smiling young woman standing in front of, or sitting in front of my granddad, um, it's a new mystery for me, and uh, I just discovered it again. Um, and my cousin from St. Cloud is coming down for dinner, so we're gonna have some interesting things to talk about. Find out who Mabel Taggart is, because my grandmother's name was Olive Jane, and that's certainly not my grandmother. But um, again, yeah, no, I, I, had to, I had to tell you all that because that was great. Again, so this, that, that feeling that people get of, of, of discovering new things about their family, of feeling connected to their communities, uh, of being able to have access to open source materials that are relevant to the communities in, in which they live, and giving them tools so that they connect is really important, and I think triple, that uh, OCLC is in the right direction. So I'm looking forward to learning more about Mabel Taggart, but just want to talk a little bit about the, the digital frontier and everything that I've heard today and in talking to y'all um, I know that these challenges that the digital frontier poses I think that, that we, we they shouldn't be any problem from us because I see your passion I see the hard work you do I mean the Minnesota oh, the metadata guidelines oh my gosh yeah everything you do is appreciated and it's that passion that's going to help see us through this new digital frontier and let our patrons connect with their history so keep the conversations going, keep talking about it, and, and keep that passion lit, because it's, it's really important. Thank you very much for the privilege of letting me talk to you today. Uh, Ruth asked who the four libraries are that are working with WISE. Yes, um, I can name, I can give you one of their names. Yes, um, yes, I can give one of them. Um, actually, let me go back to my speaker notes. Who's asking a good question? I traveled with a wise salesperson recently, and I would be embarrassed to say who they are. I can get you that information. Um, Orange County Library System, who it's coming? Orange County Library System. That was a new one. Think right up. Think right. Is this? Thank you. Y'all know more than I do. Um, yes, um, those are two of them, and the other two but I'll send this to you. So Valerie asked about the, what's going on with ContentDM, yeah, what's the development schedule like? Do uh, you want me to just talk a little bit about what we're doing? So recently uh, we completely redid the front end and we spent a lot of time uh, working on the responsive interface because it's, it's just, it's, it's what people expect now. Uh, but one thing that I learned is that it took us two years to develop that. And one of the reasons is because we worked with Penn State and with another university ex on excruciatingly, uh, excruciating detail on the accessibility issues. Every single thing went back and forth. And if you all know academia, an institution's decisions like that take a long time. There's a lot of discussion. So that took, that took a long time just to get the accessibility going. So we've recently been tweaking the front end. We've got like a gallery view now instead of collections being um, siloed. But now we're working on the back end which is what I'm really excited about. And our product manager actually said it on a call the other day, so I can say it, that we're now looking at a new ingestion process. Because uh, there's, if you have ever worked with this tool, um, the paradigm is a bit old. Yes. But actually, because of AAAF, let me get rid of my speaker notes here. Because of AAAF, uh, people are able to take the code and do lots of different things with it. So let's put this back into slideshow. Let's put my slide. So people are able to do a lot of different things with it. You can add these viewers. If you just have the basic code and you've got some coding skills, you can plug all of these things into your digital repository. And that's, for me, the most exciting thing, is to let people use all those different viewers. 3D viewers, uh, Open Sea Dragon. Um, but we've made a commitment to fixing that back end which to me is huge. So I, um, yes, it, it is, and, and they're starting to put a lot more thought into it, and really, it's because of AAAF. It's because they made these decisions two or three years ago to support this framework that allows people to use all this plug-and-play software. I think that really revived the product, because otherwise, you know, uh, yeah, uh, software solutions uh, get long in the tooth, and uh, without a new interface and without thinking about the way patrons are actually gonna use these tools, so I, that's why I'm excited about Triple F. Yeah, thank you. Sure, yeah. So um, and again, I, 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 I've only been on a couple of visits with the Wise folks, so I'm giving you just you know, secondhand knowledge. But from what I understand is, instead of looking at the bibliographic record, instead of looking at the, the record for the digital item, 
you start the you have a patron record and everything is based off of the patron. So when a patron checks out an item, that gets logged as part of the statistics. And instead of looking at, you know, what's out? What's, what, what's, what's checked out? What do we need to buy? You're looking at the way that patrons are using this information. And because all of that information is stored, uh, people are able to use that data to send out marketing materials. Uh, for instance, Kevin is interested in JFK. Okay, well, it's JFK's birthday, so I'm gonna trigger, I'm just, you know, me. I'm not making an accept that this is my interpretation. I'm going to trigger something that sends him an email on JFK's birthday that says, happy birthday, JFK. Look at our new JFK materials. Okay. That kind of data-driven data decision would have been, I, I can't think of how I would have done that in a regular library setting. You know, look at the, his, you know, looked at my interest, and oh my gosh, it's JFK's birthday. And, um, but by keeping all of that information around the patron, you're able to make those decisions, and it, it spits out a lot of analytics and data. Oh, and actually, no, that's a great question. So, so she asked, oh, how, what does that mean for the patron? Like, how does that change the patron's experience? It, it actually, it doesn't. The patron's going to see the discovery layer. And they're just going to see the re they're going to see what, what they're used to. What's different is what's feeding that and the, the information that is being gleaned from uh, patron's experience and what they're doing. So yeah, the patron's not going to see anything new or weird. The discovery layer looks great. It's really the back end that it's addressing. It's what librarians do every day to try to engage patrons. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. No, that is a ser that is a huge question, um, especially because this is a European system. You know, this came, this wise came from the Netherlands. So <laughs> our privacy stuff here in the US is, um, yeah, compared to the, the stuff in, in, in the EU. So that's, a, that's something we're thinking about really, really carefully. It's, that is probably the biggest question. You've got all this data. Well, yeah. what, what are you doing with it? Who's, who's able to see it and who isn't? And are patrons able to opt in and opt out? So those are serious questions that we're thinking about. And because they're legal, especially uh, in the EU, uh, those have to be hammered out. And the four libraries that we're working with are giving us lots of feedback on what that's like. So yes, sir, that's a huge question. Thank you.